Finally, I got the iPhone 14 Pro to replace my iPhone 13 Pro, and honestly, I feel like I wasted money. Hello everyone, Matt from Real World Review, and yes, those are some socials, thank you for asking for them. But today, we're going to review the Samsung Flip slash Fold 4-esque iPhone 14 Pro, and explain how I feel about this small upgrade. Let's get started. Now I'm starting with the cameras first, because I'm not really a camera guy. I know, ironic, but my main focus is video and video editing, while photo and editing feels kind of fake. With that said, the iPhone is perfect for both of those. Now of course, the main camera in discussion and on the phone is the new 48 megapixel sensor, with this being the first megapixel upgrade in so long that Obama was president and Frank Ocean was hinting at making new music. While this is welcomed, it didn't entirely bring anything much to the table, especially for the average person, but it does allow for massive 48 megapixel raw images, but really, the phone doesn't need it. For 12 megapixel shots, they are binned down to improve quality and especially low light photography, but it didn't really need any of that in the first place, bringing a shot from 9 out of 10 to a 9.2 out of 10. The ultra-wide and telephoto sensors are both 12 megapixel cameras, which is normal, but still look really amazing and have slightly improved since the iPhone 13 Pro, especially in low light with a 3x telephoto sensor. There's also a 2x crop of the main sensor in case 3x is too much of a reach, but for me it doesn't really help that much, it sometimes feels digitally zoom, but it technically is a crop zoom, so it's not digitally, but it's also not an optical zoom, if that makes sense even though Apple calls it an optical quality telephoto. It's a strange way of saying not optical or digitally zoomed, even though it technically is both. To me, that's about the improvements over the iPhone 13 Pro, but as usual, this is worth the upgrade over the iPhone 12 series and older. The 13 series, even the non-pros, are just super solid, so the iPhone 14 Pro seems like a 5-10% to increase in overall quality. This goes with video as well, with the iPhone 13 Pro being outrageous, with the iPhone 14 Pro being slightly nicer. I'm disappointed in the lack of 8K video, but especially over the lack of 6K video at any frame rate, because you can always use the footage to make it even more stabilized and get super stable 4K video, though stability has always been perfected, at least in my eyes, since the iPhone 11 Pros. There still seems to be no camera switching from 4K 60 frames per second, which seems kind of strange to me, but we do get some other features. Cinematic mode has been upgraded to 4K 24 and 4K 30 frames per second, which finally, but I'm irritated that the iPhone 13 Pro doesn't get this even though the iPhone 14 has the same features and the same processors. There's also an action mode, but from what I've seen, this 2.8K heavy crop isn't as bad as just shooting 4K and adding some slight stabilization in post, but I guess it's cool that it works all from the phone, assuming that you have lights brighter than the sun to film it, or change the setting in the settings. Speaking of sunlight, the camera flash looks interesting and does some stuff, but I have no idea what any of that means. I never really use it except for anything as a flashlight, but it does feel a little bit brighter than the iPhone 13 Pro, so take that how you'd like. You get all the software features you would expect, like portrait mode, smart HD4, deep fusion, stupid photographic styles, which, like Slofies, I'd never hear anyone talking about. The main camera has a second gen version of the sensor shift stabilization, while the telephoto is just simply optical image stabilization. The ultra wide camera still focuses, just like the iPhone 13 Pro line. Lastly, you get the LiDAR sensor for focusing, though iPhone cameras really never need it, but it still focuses pretty fast, and like I said, you get raw photography on all of these sensors. You also get ProRes for video recording up to 4K 30 frames per second still and pointless 1080p 30 frames per second if you bought the 128GB version for some reason. Trust me, if you're shooting in ProRes, you're not going to be buying the 128GB phone. And for the front camera, we get almost everything on the back. Same ProRes video and ProRaw capabilities, as well as cinematic and portrait options, obviously. The most surprising is the final addition to the 12 megapixel camera, which is the ability to focus. Samsung did this with the Galaxy S8, and Google only did this with the Pixel 3, but finally Apple added a focusable front camera, so all your front shots and videos are going to be a little bit clearer. So now you can record 4K 60 frames per second video that focuses and has HDR support, making this phone a truly perfect vlogging device. The last tidbit is that there is a photonic engine, whatever that truly means, and macro photography and video is now a little bit better than last year. As expected, the camera setup lacks a few features that I would expect, but is a huge powerhouse for 99% of people. 
Now that the boring but exciting part is over, we can talk about the phone and my experiences with it starting with the outside. We get a new purple color, but I chose space black, which is slightly darker than the graphite iPhone 13 Pro that I have. Looking at the side of the phone, we get normal side and volume buttons, as well as a silent switch, a 5G antenna on the US versions, and that's it. Since I have the US version, I don't get a physical SIM card, leaving us with only eSIM support. I moved to eSIM and then got this phone while I was on Visible. Yeah, bad idea because it took two hours to fix. So if you have Visible, definitely activate your eSIM on the new phone, not before. On the top, we get nothing, but on the bottom, since the SIM card is gone, we have the headset jack. I'm just kidding. There's a second speaker allowing for stereo feel, dual microphones, and an ancient lightning port that still only supports USB 2.0. You know what, I care about it for the principle of it, but transferring files through a cable is kind of annoying, so airdrop for life. The port does allow for around 25 watts of charging, while the back has 7.5 watts of wireless charging, or 15 watts if you use a MagSafe charger. The battery is a 3200 milliamp cell, or 12.38 watt hour, depending on how you look at it, and will last you all day. Now to ruin the not surprise, this phone does have an always on display, and it sucks a lot of battery. Still with it on, a full day is easy to do, but two days of battery life seems pretty much impossible. I'm seeing about a 25% battery drain per day when you use the always on display. And yes, the rumors and reviewers are telling the truth. The battery life does seem worse than the iPhone 13 Pro and is even worse than my one year old iPhone 13 Pro that I compare it to. But there are a lot of things in this phone that drain the battery, like the A16 processor that is dramatically faster and better with games when compared to the A13, I guess. This is paired with six gigabytes of RAM and 128, 256, 512 gigabytes, or in this case, one terabyte of super fast NVMe-like storage. The processor is definitely overkill for a lot of people, but that's good for the future. So that means that this phone will last a lot longer, but that also means the A13, A14, and A15 processor will probably last a lot longer too. There are more 5G bands than usual, and GPS is now dual band for satellite connectivity for emergencies only, something I won't and can't test, especially since it comes out in November, just like the crash detection feature, though that is out right now. Google had this since the Pixel 4a era, but Apple does have a high G accelerometer and barometer to confirm that the device was actually in an accident. Seems like a feature that can work, but would be less reliable if they put it in older devices. You know, to possibly save people's lives. Crazy idea, right? There's also a high dynamic range gyro, which I don't really have an idea what the HDR part means, or what it could be used for, but it is there. Going back to the 5G talk, I do find it interesting that the iPhones have had CDMA in their phones since the iPhone 4, and the iPhone SE 2022 started the end of CDMA with the iPhone 14 series following suit. The iPhone 4 was also the first time that Apple literally changed SIM cards to make a micro size, the nano size going with the iPhone 5, before getting rid of them with eSIM on the iPhone XS, with the iPhone 14 not allowing any SIMs at all, except for the eSIM. Again, that last part is only in the US. That was a lot of talk about networks, so let's finish off this section. The phone is still dust and water resistant, being IP68 rated up to 6 meters for 30 minutes, or 19.7 feet. And with what Apple did with the SIM removal and the earpiece change, I would assume that it's going to be a lot harder for people to get water into this phone. But I do know people, and I do know that they will figure out a way to get water into this phone. They always do. I do enjoy that they chose 6.1 inches for the screen, being pretty much the perfect size, not too small and not too big. It is a Super Retina XDR display, which pretty much means that it's an OLED screen that supports HDR and gets to a blistering 2000 nits of peak brightness. Of course, that's outdoor usage, with HDR content making 1600 nits, while normal is 1000 nits. So that's the same thing as the iPhone 13 Pro, just with 400 nits more when viewing HDR content and technically double the outdoor brightness, because they don't list that for the iPhone 13 Pro. Personally, I didn't notice the difference, even in direct sunlight, maybe because both phones don't really have issues in sunlight. Now the screen resolution is slightly different, but it still retains the 460 pixels per inch, so slightly different, but you'll probably not notice that difference. You get the ProMotion display, which maxes out at 120 hertz and apparently goes down to 1 hertz, which is apparently what allows you to finally have an always-on display, and I'm not the first person to say, but it sucks. This has to be the worst implementation, and wow, does it show. Check this out. Let's say you lock the phone when you're changing something in the control center. 
What? Why the weird delay, and why does it look so bad? No customization really, just a button to turn it on or off. That's it. I wish you had the option to black it out, and ironically it would glitch and sometimes show that, but it's not supposed to happen. Just the software for that in the lock screen is just so clunky. I just hope Apple eventually fixes this. Similar to the Apple Watch, the always on display sounds good and makes sense, but it's technically the worst always on display that I've ever seen or used. Then of course the main attraction, Notch Island. You know the actual name, but I'm going to call it the Notch Island. The addition of some things like the camera and microphone indicators are very welcomed and pretty useful, while some other features can be boring or not even accurate. There's a lot here, but it seems like a smaller notification area that opens up to a widget, but outside of items playing, the island is kind of frustrating. It gets into videos and even some games, but that can be jarring depending on the content. As for viewing content, the iPhone screens have pretty much been top tier since they went to OLED, but the island can be annoying. While listening to music or you have a video playing in the background, the island gets bigger and even eats part of those things in that notch area and those things can be cellular connection type or even phone service bars. They definitely thought that one through. But when not using it, it's a smaller area than the notch that gives you extra space for... nothing. Just like the notch on the MacBook Pro, it is where the extra status bar stuff hangs out, so it's not eating up screen real estate. Cool. But with this, it does the same thing, but doesn't give you extra other than small space on the top for weird graphical glitches all the time, weird full screen experiences, awkward game playing experiences, and remember you can actually make it bigger, or smaller technically. You can kind of swipe stuff away like a timer when counting, but barely. Playing music with that timer? Now you get the hole punch pill like the renders, but now it's even more exaggerated. Like I said, Apple really thought this one through. I'm only kidding though, because it is a cool idea taking up less space than what you would get with phone calls, connecting headphones, and such, so it does have its purpose, but just like the always on display, it's definitely not perfect. Unlike the always on display, you can't turn this off, you're stuck with it all the time. iPhones have always been premium, the ceramic shield and stainless steel frame prove that, with even the camera glasses being made out of sapphire, though the phone is not indestructible. Apple is going for premium at the end of the day, and that's what you get out of this phone. But the software, this starting with iOS 16, is good in some ways and straight embarrassing in others. It is funny seeing the camera shaking glitch and phone activation issues that Apple patched with iOS 16.0.2, but what about the control center glitch? Or the black lock screen glitch? Speaking of lock screen, it looks nice and awesome, but Apple actually killed live wallpapers now. It was a big deal with the iPhone 6S, yes, the 6S, but now it's gone altogether just like the iPhone 6S. It's little stuff like that that actually makes you wish that you can control your iPhone more, even though I think that's not entirely needed. With that said, here's a screenshot of my iPhone 4S being jailbroken in 2015, and here's the iPhone 14 Pro in 2022 playing the exact same song. And honestly, some random developer that made this on the 4S made it look better than what Apple can do. And that was seven years ago. Lastly, for the love of whatever Apple believes in, please allow the notifications to be displayed differently. Having them at the bottom makes it just look weird and just downright annoying when you have the always on display on. Also, those notifications don't always update properly. And even more pointless if you have the preview disabled, it really should just show you an app, not that you have a notification. But also it looks weird if you don't have the preview disabled. I pray that Apple fixes these dumb changes soon, but I'm assuming iOS 17 or iOS 19 will probably fix them. And honestly, I can talk all day about the upsides and downsides of the iPhone 14 Pro, whether we're talking about hardware or software, but I do have to end this review. Notice I didn't say much about the performance because, well, it doesn't really matter on these phones. Going from the iPhone 12 Pro to 13 Pro actually made a little bit more sense than going from the 13 Pro to the 14 Pro. But even coming from the 12 Pro to the 14 Pro, I would say it's kind of a coin toss if you should actually upgrade. If you have an iPhone 12 or older, the iPhone 14 Pro would be a pretty good upgrade, though the battery life might not be as good as you expect or even what you're used to. And if you have the iPhone 13 Pro, don't upgrade. The notch in Camera Island is not worth the upgrade, but that's my review of the iPhone 14 Pro. Let me know what you think, and as always, thanks for watching.